Yep. Thanks, Artemis, for the great talk. Now it's time for questions and answers. Uh, we will. I will paste the questions here, and Artemis will choose which ones to answer. Please don't post a lot of questions in the mumble chat uh, and fill up the buffer. There's a limit to what I can see on the screen, so make sure it's visible. Don't get too far ahead. Sure, I will only paste one or two questions at a time. I think it would also be helpful if you read out the questions as you answer them, Richard. Okay. Uh, well, this question is a little silly. Uh, it's based on sort of all or none thinking. Uh, pragmatically, how are people that buy into these ideals, I find that term offensive, uh, and especially those that build the software meant to live slash thrive sort of short of renouncing many of the luxuries of modern life. Oh, this is basically, it's repackaged standard uh, you'll die if you if you don't write proprietary software but most people in the world don't write proprietary software and that doesn't kill them uh whatever you do to make money if you're reasonably well paid at it which if you're working in software i hope you are that enables you to have a lot of time to do something else like write some free software even supposing you find no way to make any money from f the free software world but uh that's just a worst case and for a lot of people the life they find does isn't the worst case so i think it's basically in the question's an exaggeration and we don't need to worry about it there are many businesses which do hire people to write free software. So write whatever free program for the business that the business wants you to write and make sure you get permission to write your own software and release it as free software and contribute it to free software projects and you'll be able to contribute. In addition, one very big part of the software business is custom software development for a client one client at a time basically and if that business is not treating its clients as suckers it will release the code to them under a free software license okay there you, you are you're getting paid to write free software perfectly ethical I have been admiring your work f for free software for many years now. I'm a bit concerned about what will happen to the GNU project when you retire. Have you planned how to manage the GNU project in, lo in the long run? I haven't found a way. I had an idea for what to do. I hoped to uh, train some people who were activists and committed supporters to uh, start making some decisions without me and I would give them feedback but I didn't succeed in getting them uh, to discuss issues and propose decisions well I guess I'll have to try again over Oh, just a second, I have to go and open the door. In response to your version to JavaScript support in Emacs in the same way,
that to revolt against the non-free spirit in software development, one has to develop software and that to fight non-free compilers, one has to write a free compiler. Can you fairly consider rejection of JavaScript as a tool conducive to improving the state of free JavaScript? There's a fundamental confusion here. The problem with JavaScript is not comparable to the problem of non-free C compilers or whatever, or C++ compilers or Java compilers. This is a totally different kind of issue. The problem, we have free Java support. Uh, free browsers have, sorry, free JavaScript support. Free, jo free browsers contain that. That's not the issue. Uh, the issue is, what about the programs you're going to run? If you're talking about C, well, if you're going to run a C program, it's because, and compile it first, it's because you got the source code. Probably it's free software, or else it's some um, uh, private project, uh, internal project, and there's no particular danger in that. Uh, if JavaScript were just like that, there'd be no particular danger in JavaScript either. The problem is that uh, hundreds of thousands of websites, or is it millions, are sending JavaScript programs to their visitors who don't even know what JavaScript is, who are not programmers, who have no idea what's going on. So these non and these programs are usually non-free. They end up in the user's browser. They run. Many of them are malware. So what's going to happen? Basically, JavaScript is a platform for websites to mistreat users. I know it can be used in other ways, but socially, the existence of those other ways makes little difference. The important thing about JavaScript is the danger that it creates. Uh, this question is about the idea of using Emacs Lisp uh, for general purpose programming that has nothing to do with Emacs. Well, uh, in theory, I guess there's no, in principle, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that would be a distraction, and I'd rather we didn't do it. Now, if we had a thousand great programmers ready to do that, and every other thing we could use, sure. But the fact is we don't. And uh, I'd really rather, there are many platforms that are fine to write programs on. So I'd rather we work on making Emacs better at editing and improving Emacs Lisp in the ways that help that goal and leave gener developing general purpose of program platform programming platforms to other languages. Uh, could I give a list of the uh, specific medium-sized jobs necessary for WYSIWYG editing? Well, I can't really. I don't have a list of one, and I. I'd really appreciate it if people started putting together such a list. But if you look at every feature that LibreOffice has that Emacs doesn't have, I think you will get a list. Uh, now, maybe some of those are not that important. Maybe only a subset of them would make the, the list of really important ones. Uh, but I think that will give everybody a start. Should GNU or someone else define a safe subset of HTML, CSS, JS to make web browsers simpler and safer? You know, that would be an interesting thing to explore. 
but I don't know whether it can be done. The thing is, one of one of the dangerous things about JavaScript is browser profiling. Every machine runs a program at a slightly different speed, and the idea of browser programming, pro, pro, browser profiling, is that uh, the website sends a JavaScript program to run on every visitor's browser, and in each and it's a, it's actually a collection of benchmarks and the collection of results is different for each user's computer and so it enables the website to recognize each one when it comes back even if there's no cookie to help it so which features are sufficient to make possible uh, browser profiling there may be no particular unusual feature that's crucial. Arithmetic might be enough. How can we ensure the continuity of an understanding of the more arcane parts of source code and increase their evolvability, notably with regard to display, uh, single threading limitations, etc.? Well, single threading is a very specific thing. And, uh, you know, th the furthest that I've bothered to think about it is uh, how could we enable, you know, how can we enable easily multiple list program threads to be running in parallel? But if you're talking about uh, multi threading in display, I don't know if that even helps. Uh, of course, my machine doesn't really enable me to run uh, multiple threads in a, a single program, so it never mattered to me. Uh, basically, uh, now, uh, development of a display code not in regard to threads, well, that's that's more feasible but the thing is it's generally any new feature is likely to require changes in the buffer data structure to represent the use of the feature and I think that's going to be the hard part uh, so display won't be the hard part and it won't be the first part the first part is figuring out how you're going to represent a buffer with a certain display uh, bell or whistle in it and once you've worked that out and worked out how it's going to work well in editing then I think you'll be able to uh, f figure out what display has to do to handle it of course you have to decide that data decide that data structure thinking about how display is going to handle it efficiently if the data structure is bad it won't be possible to display efficiently so you need to think about that at that stage but the actual work is working out the data structure and the editing to handle it do you recommend reaching out to schools for volunteers instead of universities because they're more prone to value the objectives of freedom uh, well Reaching out for what? Reaching out to try to teach people about freedom or reaching out to uh, to find more developers? Maybe that person could uh, respond. Is there any problem or disadvantage in using the GNU AGPL for non-network software like Emacs packages? Uh, I don't see one. The reason why I didn't put the AGPL clause into the regular GNU GPL is it, it seemed a bit radical and I figured the community would be happier if uh, the uh, if that radical change didn't happen in the GNU general public license itself. I would like the person who asked the previous question to respond to what I said so I can get that answer and finish answering his or her question.
Right. I will let you know if we end up hearing back from them. From Per. Is there a list of Emacs issues which can be solved by programmers with different levels? Uh, I don't know of one. I tend to think that uh, people who know basic program, the basic level of list program programming, can't contribute yet. Uh, they might be able to start debugging problems. It won't be easy, but uh, that might be a good first thing to do. <clears throat> Look at bugs that are waiting and see if you can debug one of them. And then when you find out what's actually going wrong, you can send that to the developers and it will very likely enable them to fix the problem quickly. And in the process, you'll learn a lot about programs and how programs are actually written, how to understand the code you actually come across. With features like org mode and enriched mode, it seems that Emacs is getting closer to the goal of WYSIWYG. Well, it's got somewhat closer, but it has a very long way to go. I mean, if you compare it with something like LibreOffice, you'll see how long a way there is to go. There was an effort called Guile Emacs a while back, and there was some effort to get Guile to be able to compile and run Emacs Lisp. Uh, you mentioned there were still some challenges relating to Guile. What roadblocks kept some of the other efforts from being used with Emacs? Well, uh, we never finished solving the problem of reconciling Guile data types with Emacs Lisp data types. I got an idea to, for how to uh, deal with the fact that uh, scheme handling of nil is different from Lisp handling of nil. And the idea was that maybe this would get us close enough it could actually work. But I don't think anyone fully implemented it and made it actually work. What do you use Emacs for beyond editing? Well, I use it for reading and writing email. That's what I mainly do. That's what I do most of the day. I could, uh, uh, I mean, should I sing my song? Uh, sure. I've been answering my email all the goddamn day. I've been answering my email because my work gets done that way. Can't you feel the fingers aching? Type until early in the morn. Can't you see the letters blurring? It's just an ad for porn. You can see how out of date that song is because uh, we don't get ads for porn much anymore. Thanks for the performance. Emacs is used by a small population relative to the population that could benefit from it. Do you have any thoughts on how to expand the user base more broadly, even among software developers? No. Basically, uh, the fact is that on that aspect of things, VS Code has an advantage, and the advantage comes from Microsoft. Uh, it's uh, pushing that together with a, as part of a large collection of evil proprietary software that subjugates its users. But those users don't understand that issue. So, I mean, I sure wish I could come up with a, an idea for how to 
spread awareness of free software and the injustice of non-free software. The best one that I know of is to show them the TEDx talk that you saw. If you show that to people, they'll get at least a basic idea of what's at stake here and why. Would a namespace system similar to common list packages but without use work in Emacs? I suppose it would. I mean, uh, basically, the, the thing that's really broken about common list packages is use, uh, but it's not crucial, or at least it's not crucial to allow that to exist uh, for arbitrary use. You know, maybe you want to have something saying where a package can specify whether to use the standard system functions and variables and so on. But there is a drawback to common list packages, which is that all of the aspects of any given symbol have to go together. So if a uh, if compile dash foo is a variable and it's also a function and it's also a property name, then uh, if your symbol foo is alias to compile dash foo, that means it's aliased as a function, aliased as a variable, and aliased as a property name. And any an alias is anything else that you're going to point to from list structure. So uh, you're, so it's not going to work really smoothly. And I tend to think that we're better off with a naming convention. <clears throat> Since the use feature of common list packages causes trouble, <clears throat> well, if you don't use that, why is it better to write compile colon foo and have that be foo in the compile package than to write compile dash foo? The packages are almost equivalent to name prefixes. And I think that there is an advantage of clarity to writing the name prefixes even in the same file. That abbreviation which is meant to just shorten the code and make it simpler, uh, look simpler, I believe doesn't actually help. And I say that based on many years of writing code that way. With Emacs 29 adding more awesome features into vanilla Emacs, how should we ensure vanilla Emacs does not get bloated with many similar features. Example, uh, I do slash I complete VC slash maggot. Uh, well, to some extent we can't. Users do things differently. I have never used maggot because I don't want to get used to using anything that's not packages that are not actually part of Emacs. Now, a couple of years ago, the author of Maggot said he was starting to work on getting the copyright assignments to include Maggot in Emacs. But uh, I was unable to get any information on how this is progressing. So because I've never actually seen Maggot and because uh, Git is actually not the, the VC system that I use most, I don't know if I'd want to use Maggot. I'd probably be happier using VC. I'm told that they have extremely different basic approaches to doing things. They're not just slight variants of each other. Now, having multiple slight variants, you know, things doing similar jobs in little different ways, that could be seen as redundant. But when packages have very different approaches, I think that's not redundant. Clarified version of earlier question. Do you recommend reaching out in schools for volunteers for both advocacy and development instead of universities? I think that you'll find few people 
in high schools. I think this, I think the question when it says schools means high schools. I think you will find only very rarely someone in high school who is good enough at programming to start actually developing things. Once in a while, I guess. For, as an activist, I think somewhat more, somewhat more often. Uh, but the main thing is, do you know how to have a rapport with high school students? If you do, it would be a great thing to try. There, ha we have had some projects of uh, teaching free software to people in public schools. And if you want to work on that, I suggest uh, sending me an email and I'll put you in touch with someone who's done it. What was the thought process behind making Emacs Lisp dynamically scoped? It was easy. I knew perfectly well how to write a simple small Lisp interpreter that was dynamically scoped and small was absolutely necess necessary sorry absolutely necessary at the time because I was trying to make it able to run in a machine whose total address space was one megabyte so the code had to be small why did I implement if and I believe not cond. Uh, why did I implement or and not unless? Uh, because you didn't need those others. You could write your Lisp code with a smaller Lisp interpreter if you didn't have those other convenient uh, traditional standard parts of Lisp. So I stripped Emacs Lisp down to bare bones. Of course, nowadays that's not necessary anymore. Uh, Emacs used to be criticized as eight megabytes and constantly swapping. And someone pointed out to me 10 years ago that if something's only eight megabytes, it's not gonna swap at all anymore. It's hard to pick up Emacs if you do not speak English. Can something be done to address that? Uh, well, what do you actually suggest? Is it the documentation? Is it the names of commands? Is it the doc strings or is it the manual or both? Uh, is it the messages that Emacs displays? I mean, each of these is a different issue technically. Now the easiest thing to f deal with would be the messages because in other GNU packages we have a system for internationalizing messages. It's hard to adapt it directly to Emacs because it's designed for programs, tools or applications that have a fixed set of messages to display. Emacs doesn't. You load in a different list program, it's got a different set of messages how exactly you want to handle this well, but it could be done it's not a terribly hard problem if you're interested please work on it uh, what about the command names well you could imagine coming up with an alternate set of command names and maybe a different character instead of meta x so that it would read only the translated command names and the uh, ordinary Emacs command names wouldn't get in the way. Now, and made X might still be there, but uh, if you type this other thing, uh, made a foobar, then uh, it would only complete over the command names in the other language. This might be pretty simple to do technically, although working out the details might take a good deal of thought. <clears throat> and then document uh, doc strings well you could just write another set of them and have other other help commands to display them do you use org or org mode and if so to what extent I have never used them 
and here's why. Uh, I think that the design process of org mode went awry, not at the very beginning, but at the next stage. Originally, org mode was an outlining mode. It's not something I wanted to use. I had nothing against including it, but I didn't ever try to use it. Uh, the documentation of it somehow wasn't easy for me to grasp, especially since I had no actual use for it, no reason to go through and remember all those things. Anyway, then people started developing other facilities to use the org syntax, and they're totally unrelated to each other. They just happen to use the org syntax. And some of them, occasionally, I thought it might be interesting to use this. But to use it first, I'd have to learn the org syntax. And that was a task that had already proved discouraging. Now, the mistaken design, I think, was to integrate all those other facilities with org mode. They should all have been separate, modularly separate, so that you could maybe use them with org mode if you wanted to, but also use them with separately from org mode and they'd be documented separately and those I wanted to use I would have learned to use. But that was hard to do. They had been welded together such that it was not easy to separate them. I really wish they'd get separated but that's not an easy job. Each one needs to be remodularized. Anyway, there is something for which I think org mode could become uh, an advance. I mean, I'm not saying it isn't useful for people who like what it does, but it might play an important role uh, if it were extended to do it. And that is, we could use a we could use a replacement for tech info. Tech info's syntax is arcane. It was based on what I could implement on top of tech in 1984 or so. And uh, well org mode, org syntax doesn't make all the distinctions, all the semantic markup distinctions that we can make in tech info. If it did, which would require extending it, then it might become a, a good format to write GNU manuals in. It could conceivably become a better format than we have now. And that would be a good thing. Uh, not that many people know tech info syntax. It's not widely used except for GNU manuals. But probably more people know org syntax. And if it were extended so that it did in a fairly natural way all the things that Tech Info does and maybe some additional ones, then it could be superior. And then we could gradually switch our manuals over to it. But we need to be able to generate all the output formats that we can generate now. That means HTML to put on websites. That means either info files or perhaps another form of the HTML output that would be good for a, an info browser, including the one inside Emacs and the one that's separate, and generating input to tech so that it would generate pretty looking manuals, which is one of the advantages of tech info. This is not a gigantic job. I'd say this is a medium sized job or maybe two or three medium-sized jobs. What do you have in mind for more modular Emacs development? I think that that's, there's no specific uh, feature that I have in mind to solve that. It's more of an approach to how you develop things. Uh, and it's thinking about modularity when you write each package that you write because you will find situations where it has to interact in various ways with other packages. 
And sometimes you'll find the other packages have hooks that will enable you to do it. And sometimes you'll find that the hook you'd really need for this is missing. In that case, the best thing to do might be to add a suitable, fairly general hook that can be used for your job to the other existing package. So that instead of a, a rigid connection to other parts of Emacs, which is somewhat unmodular, you could use a general purpose hook, which you designed because it could do a lot of things, including the thing you need to do. might be interesting to reframe the school question. I think it is related to the first part, how to bring Libra software into schools. For example, entry point, my entry point was LaTeX in school. Well, it's okay. I don't see anything wrong with that. Uh, by all means, if it works. Now, I, my naive perhaps guess is that it wouldn't arouse much interest because I suspect most people would rather use a WYSIWYG text editor than, uh, a, than a text formatter like LaTeX, uh, any text formatter. Uh, but if your experience is otherwise, go ahead. In the light of that critique, critique of JavaScript not being about the language per se, but rather the culture of blindly getting and running packages, libraries, what's so different with what's currently done by the vast majority of Emacs Lisp users to just install packages blindly? Oh, well, they know they're installing a package, and that makes all the difference. And people can post various versions of a package, and then people can compare them and say, hey, I looked at that version there and it has a horrible bug. Uh, and so the community can do something about that. With JavaScript sent by websites, there is no way to do anything like that. And in addition, most of those programs are not free. How would you know if you're not running LibreJS? You don't know what JavaScript programs are being installed into your browser at any given moment or whether they're free. Uh, you know, very likely you'll just get a bunch of obfuscript and you won't know what the source code is or whether you could even find it. These things don't happen with Emacs Lisp packages, at least not when they're in reputable. Uh, package archives. Still, do you still intend to merge your patch to the shorthands feature to the master branch? Uh, yes, but I've seen that things something needs to be done with the doc strings uh, because uh, s dot el mentions in its doc strings the function names used in s dot el and the magnars string library that works just by what by renaming those symbols really would want to alter the doc strings too uh, and now that there are multiple ways of doing that one of them maybe is to edit the s dot el source file so it'll do the right thing in either case that we that would need a new doc string construct well, uh, we've added many doc string constructs. We could add one more. It's not that hard a thing. Do you think the freedom, e.g., we have in Emacs becomes a hurdle for some people to pursue more important things in the world? Is there something more important in the world? I used to do a lot of Emacs programming, but recently I decided to stay away from tink linking, from tinking Emacs. I'm not sure what, tinking is a strange word to me, tinkering with maybe. Uh, well, there may be more important things for you to do than uh, extend Emacs. Uh, 
On the other hand, when you look at all the distractions that the world offers that distract a lot more people than this, it really seems unfair to criticize Emacs because it's something you could put a lot of time into tinkering with. Look how much time people put into playing video games, which achieves nothing uh, except distracting them. And you can distract if you distract yourself by playing with Emacs Lisp code. That's surely better. It has a chance of resulting in something actually useful, and a chance that you'd learn something uh, that's more important as learning than how to win a certain video game. Questions about software freedom. How does it apply to software that are art slash media experiences like video games in your view? Well, uh, I'd say that a video game typically is a, a collection of things, uh, w some of which are programs and some of which are art. And so once you analyze the game in that way, if you agree with my ideas about what the moral rules are for each of those categories, you can apply them separately to each thing in the collection. Programs are operational. They do things for you. And anything that does things for you should be free. The art that is simply displayed is not uh, of that kind, so it doesn't, in my view, have to be free. It does have to be shareable. Uh, you have to be free to non-commercially redistribute an exact copy. When I talk about sharing, that's what it means, precisely that. Non-commercially redistribute exact copies to others when you wish. How would technologies like WebAssembly fit in this jo in with the JavaScript issues? They don't change anything much. Basically, uh, if the program is JavaScript source code that you could actually read, well, then if it had a free license on it, it would be free software. And if the free li license is indicated in the uh, standardized format that LibreJS understands, it would actually recognize it as free software. Uh, if it's obfuscated, then it's not the source code. And if it's WebAssembly, then it's not the source code. So it's a those are both compiled versions of source code that isn't in the page. So they make things somewhat nastier, but they, in the sense that you couldn't have much chance of reading it and seeing what it does. Uh, but either way, it's non-free, whether it's, even if it's source code with no free license, still non-free. If it's a compiled version rather than source, that's a little further away from being free, but uh, further away from being free doesn't make it worse. It, it's equally bad. The, if something, if, if it gets further away from being free, that means the work that you might have to do to free it is more, but it's not worse. You know, non-free is bad. Have you seen Hacatillo? Uh, it seems limited, similar to LibreJS. Hacatillo is meant to enable people to get some of the benefits of the free software community with free replacement JavaScript programs for websites. So potentially it offers a real solution to the JavaScript problem. It has a long way to go from what I hear. If you want to work on it, please do. Of course, writing free replacement JavaScript for a million websites is an enormous job, but maybe we could do it for some sites. Depends how many people get enthusiastic about doing it and how many sites cooperate. Is writing free software replacement to GitHub Cop uh, co 
Copilot with proper license attribution a good idea? Maybe, but remember that Copilot is not a program. Copilot is a service. It is something that somebody else's computer will do for you. Uh, it's a computation that someone else's server will do for you when you ask. And uh, so what are the practical problems of doing that? I'm not sure. Uh, so the point is, of course, the server runs by you by running a program. The service operates by running programs. But still, a service is a very different kind of thing from a program. The people who use Copilot don't get any sort of copy of Copilot. All they do is send uh, send something they're working on to that server, and they get something back. Uh, so it might be a good idea do you have any suggestions such for helping prospective contributors streamline the copyright assignment needed to contribute to emacs i don't think that's needed basically it normal oh the copyright assignment itself is pretty easy and doesn't take very long the what is sometimes harder is the copyright disclaimer the employer disclaimer where your employer if you're employed to program or if your job includes programming or could include programming we want to be sure that your employer is not going to say that you had no right to contribute that to any program because it belonged to the employer all along and you broke the rules and the project you contributed to is shafted. Well, we are working on some simplifications to that, that text in the hope of making it easier to get companies to say yes to it. But fundamentally, they've got to say yes to it. When we need them to say yes to it. We can't make them say yes to it. We can only ask. Uh, can complexity induced by company funded? Uh, sorry, it talks about open code. I don't know what that means. Uh, is this talking about free software? I think it would be safe to assume that they are indeed talking about free software. Okay, because I don't use the term open to classify programs. Uh, I'm not a supporter of open source, and I never was. And the reason is uh, is very important. Uh, I hinted, I, I touched on this briefly in the TEDx video, but basically the idea of the free software movement is that users deserve the freedom to study, change, and redistribute the, the code that they use and uh, it is an injustice to deny that to users and therefore uh, software must be free it's wrong if it's not free well the people who created the idea of open source about 14 years later uh, they wanted to avoid bringing up that question and they more or less succeeded when people talk about open source Occasionally, that question has seeped in from the free software community, but most of the time it never occurs to them. They simply take for granted that it's legitimate for a program not to be open. Well, uh, that's missing the point that I consider most important. So whenever I talk about this area, I talk about it in terms of free, libre, uh, freedom respecting software. So, uh, can complexity induced by company-funded free code become a problem when the company pulls out, leaving the code potentially unmaintainable? Well, I'd say overcomplicated uh, free programs, which don't have community contributors, can come into that can fall into that problem. But it's not limited to programs developed by companies. I think.
uh, what do you think of hyperbole or EEV instead of org mode? Well, uh, I don't actually know that much about either of them. I don't know what EEV is. I've heard of hyperbole, but it was many years ago that I looked at it and I don't remember what I saw. So I'm sorry, I can't have an educated opinion about those specific things. It would be interesting for somebody to study that. Now, uh, there'd be a lot to study. After all, org mode it consists of an outlining mode together with lots of other specific features that have been welded onto it. Uh, and if they were separated, made modular, separate parts of Emacs, it would be a lot easier to adapt some of them to work with hyperbole if we wanted to. Of course, do we want to? That's another question. Uh, what is EEV? I think it's similar in many ways to hyperbole. Um, I haven't used either of them too much myself, but yeah, they are fairly similar as far as I know. If they're fairly similar, I guess that brings up the question, is either of them actually part of Emacs? Um, I think hyperbole is a GNU package. I'm not sure if it's part of Emacs or GNU ELPA. It might be, but EEV is not as of yet, but both are free software. Well, I, it might be that it doesn't make sense to include them both in any sense. I mean, people can write them and distribute them, but that doesn't mean we need to pick them up. We might want to compare them and see which one is better and then look at whether it could be improved further by bringing in features from the other. Uh, this is what you do if you if those two things exist and you want to make the best possible thing to add, for instance, to Emacs. Yep. But since I don't know any specifics anymore, and with EV, I never did, I don't want to state any sort of a priori preference. I don't have one. Are there plans for bring to bring modal editing to Emacs core? What does that mean? I think they're speaking about um, projects or editing modes such as VI, where by default, whatever you insert is not actually, sorry, whatever you type is not getting inserted, but you're, you can navigate bet between different modes, and one of them being text insertion. Well, uh, I don't see, I don't have a wish for that. Uh, now, I mean, it's not somehow morally anathema. I mean, it's not as if it were a non-free program. Uh, but it wouldn't be easy to design that in such a way that it fit into the framework of existing Emacs without doing any violence to it. What is your opinion of the current state of large machine learning models? Even if the model is released under a free license it cannot be modified in a meaningful way i don't think that's true uh, a person who was in the field of machine learning told me that you can modify it you can modify it by starting with what you've got and doing some further training and you don't need i'm told the previously used training data to train it to modify it based on that I concluded that the trained neural network can be treated as source code. And after all, it's not made from any other kind of source code. Uh, so in some sense, what else could the source code be? I thought it was a virtue to separate the content from the style or appearance of information. Part of being free is also to view information in the format you want. Does your WYSIWYG idea erode this virtue and lead to more thinking, uh, perhaps undo thinking about style over substance? Well, I don't know. Uh, 
actually. Uh, I know that in LibreOffice, you can make named styles and you can apply them to parts of the text. And later on, you can change what any given named style means in terms of appearance. So is that enough uh, independence of appearance from semantics? I am hardly a power user of LibreOffice. I've come across that feature. I've never used it. All the, the only things I write with it are pretty simple. Uh, I have a feeling that I've been doing this for a rather long time. Do you recall when I started answering questions? I think it was something like an hour ago. Um, yeah, I think so. About an hour or 45 minutes-ish. Well, then I'll do a few, a few questions more. Do you ever dabble Thanks. in retro computing? No. I decided it's a waste of time. Uh, it basically would be tinkering that would not develop anything of any importance or use. Uh, and I know that if I'm going to enjoy developing something, I could do, enjoy it developing anything. You know, I could ju enjoy just as much developing something that I think is needed right now for non-retro computing as I could enjoy working on retro computing. So I decided never to let retro computing distract my attention from useful computing. Do you know the Gemini project, a network of very simplified markdown like text files without images and third party materials transmitted via an open public free protocol which is not HTTPS, HTTPS. I don't remember if I ever heard of that before. Sorry, I have no opinion about it. But I think that the lack of images will turn out to be uh, a considerable drawback. I mean, imagine a website well, there are lots of reasons you might want to put in images. It's not limited just to uh, making it look uh, snazzy and distracting. There are a lot of pictures you might want to include and diagrams and scientific papers include pictures and diagrams. And it would be crippling if they couldn't be in there. So. Uh, basically, I think that exclusion of images is a big loss. Thanks. I think that's so far all the questions I see on the pad, but uh, let's give it maybe another minute or two if people have any other question or two to get in before we uh, call this close. Well, I'd like to mention that uh, if, you, if you've if you heard rumors of uh, attacks against me that people have made, uh, it's mostly false. And you can find out more by looking at stallmansupport.org. So I refer you there, uh, and I hope you'll take a look. Yes, thank you. All right, I think that's pretty much all the questions that we have. Um, thanks again, Richard, both for your great talk and also for taking this much time answering so many questions. We really appreciate it. Well, it's this is what I do. Uh, GNU and the free software movement are what I've dedicated my life to. And since I'm still alive, I've got more to dedicate to them.
Wonderful. And yeah, we all hope that it uh, keeps on coming and you're able to continue for a very long time into the future. Happy hacking. Happy hacking. Bye.